Hello, I'm not Chuck. This video is part two in a three-part series showing how I built the double sideband digital transceiver 2 from QRP guys. Part one focused on the individual band modules. Part two, this part, shows the main printed circuit board assembly. And part three will deal with the optional variable frequency oscillator, or VFO. There are several improvements from version 1 to version 2 of the transceiver, including replacing a relay with solid state switching and the introduction of a surface mount component, the 8 pin SA602 or 612 mixer integrated circuit. Soldering this SMD is not as difficult as you might think, especially after you watch how I do it. Now let's get started. At this point, there should be nothing installed on the main transceiver PCB. Locate the spot for U1, clean the solder pads with some isopropyl alcohol, and then wipe the pads dry. Add a little flux to all of the pads. Look at the drawings on page 4 of the assembly manual to be absolutely sure you know where both pin 1 and pin 8 are on the integrated circuit. And then put a small amount of solder on pad 8 as I have done. Then place the IC in the correct orientation on the pads and tack down pin 8. When all of the IC pins are correctly aligned with the pads, solder each one in place. Notice that when I was soldering the left side pins, I had some trouble and formed a solder bridge between pins 2 and 3. First I tried to wipe it off with the tip of the iron, and when that didn't work, I used some copper braid to remove the excess solder from pins 2 and 3, and then from all the pins. Next, I cleaned the flux residue from the pins. That really wasn't necessary, except that I wanted to show you a close-up of all of the solder connections which, as you can see, turned out pretty well. The fibers you see are from the cotton swab and are not a problem. Here I have installed and soldered inductor L4, diodes D1 through D4, and resistors R1 through R21. There is no polarity for the inductor nor for the resistors. Just follow the numbers and the color code on pages 1 and 2 of the assembly manual. The diodes do have a polarity. Match the band on the diode with the line on the diode marking on the printed circuit board. Refer to this photograph if necessary, but the assembly manual should be your guide. Now all the capacitors should be installed. 
C3, C7, C11, C17, and C21 are electrolytics and are polarity sensitive. They're also of two different values. The polarity is clearly shown on the capacitors and on the PCB. In addition, the longer lead on each cap goes to the positive pad on the PCB. Be sure to match them up correctly or you risk making smoke. Also, be sure not to confuse the two values. The parts list on page 1 correlates the C numbers and the values. All the remaining capacitors are non-polarized and can be installed either way around. However, there are two different values and those values must be installed in the correct places. The difficulty in doing that comes because of three issues. One, the markings on the caps are quite small and hard to read. Two, the values are coded. And three, it's easy to confuse the values with the part numbers. Here, I recommend that you read the information in the parts list on page one of the manual, sort the capacitors into two piles of identical values, mark each pile clearly, and be careful as you populate the PCB. Haste will make waste. This is the printed circuit board with almost all of the soldered parts in place. The only things missing from the photograph are the dual op amp, U2, which is not in its socket, and there is no band module. The instructions in the manual are good, except that I would wait to install J5, J6, and J7 until after the transistors. Be especially careful with those transistors. There are three different types to be soldered in, and they all must be in the right spots. Read the transistor type numbers from the flat sides. By the way, I used a little heat sink transfer compound under the tab on U3 and on the flat sides of Q6, Q7, and Q8, even though it's not called for in the instructions. So take your time and install everything called for on page 6, except T1 and T2. They have to be wound and installed in a specific way, and we'll do that next. The main PCB for the transceiver uses two identical bifiler transformers, T1 and T2. Each one is wound on a black toroid. Bifiler means that there are two wires in each winding, and the instructions say that the two wires can be lightly twisted together, which I did. I think that will make winding the wires on the toroid easier. So that you can easily tell the one wire from the other after they are on the toroid, QRP guys have provided two different color wires. In my kit, the wire colors are red and green, and both are 26 gauge enameled wires. You will need about six inches of each color and one black toroid for each transformer. The good news is that the transformers are easier to wind than the coils for the band modules. First, simply twist the two 6-inch pieces of wire loosely together. I used about 8 twists, but the exact number isn't important. Leave about an inch at each end untwisted so that the winding looks similar to the picture. Now you are ready to wind the twisted part of the wires on the toroid. Don't wind the untwisted parts. Watch as I do it.
As you can see, I had about an inch of wire left over after winding the transformers, and that's quite a bit more than is needed. However, if you're going to scrape the insulation from the wires, it's easier to do before you cut off that excess wire. I actually learned this after winding all the coils for the band modules. I'll show you what I mean. Yes, I'm using a yellow toroid, and that's not what should be used for T1 or T2. Black toroid should be used for T1 and T2, but I've already wound and installed those, so I'll just use a yellow toroid for this scraping demo. Scraping works better for me when I leave enough wire to pinch it between my thumb or finger and the blade. I try to get as close to the toroid as possible and scrape the full length of the wire. I work my way around the circumference of the wire until I can't see any insulation remaining. That's one wire done on this transformer, and three more to go. Remember that T1 and T2 actually use black toroids, not yellow, as I have used for the scraping demonstration. Here's what transformer T1 should look like when it's soldered on the PCB. Pull each of the four wires through the board until the transformer is snug against the top of the PCB. Don't pull them too tight. But when they're just right, solder the wires and then snip off the excess. Once T1 and T2 are soldered on the PCB, they need to be checked for correct orientation as described on page 7 of the assembly manual. Because the pads for the windings are impossible to get to from the top of the board, I made my check on T1 from C18 and Q9 and on T2 from C9 and C5. Look at the drawing at the top of page 7 to understand what I'm doing. There are two more tests on the main board that need to be made. The first is made with U2 out of its socket and described in the first three steps near the bottom of page 9 in the manual. On the screen they are checked in red ink. Watch as I go through the process. The second test is made with U2 installed but still without a band module.
It consists of measuring the current drawn by the circuit and then adjusting that current. Here I am following the last nine steps on page nine. They are again checked in red ink on the screen. As you see, the current draw with V1 completely clockwise is 42 milliampers. I'll add 15 milliampers to that by turning V2 counterclockwise until my DMM shows 57 milliampers. Well, that's it for this video. I hope it has helped you to get your transceiver soldered together and set up. The next video, part three, will deal with the optional VFO, which eliminates the need for a crystal in the individual band modules. I'll have that one available before long. But until then, don't forget, I'm not Chuck.